please join me in welcoming Anne hey. Cody and Kelly Mason. Yay. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Sanam. Okay, we've got a full room. I'm excited to see that. It's going to be a very exciting topic, hopefully. Um, well, we're going to make it fun and interesting yeah. anyway. <laughs> so, you know, we can. Uh, right now, we've got, like Islam said, it's the Foundations of Advocacy, Disability Advocacy, and the ADA in Action. This is Ann Cody. She's our Director of Policy and Global Outreach. My name is Cully Mason. I'm the Blaze Sports Social Media and Web Developer. I also coach the wheelchair basketball team and track team to kind of tie into why I'm doing this. So um, let's get started. Um, first thing we're going to talk about is that goes backwards. Um, the purpose of this, this session is to discuss the ADA and go through each one of the titles to educate the general public and to give you a pre presentation that you can go back home in the community and use again and spread the word about the ADA, excuse me, ADA and advocate as well. Um, we're going to go through some other resources that you can use and have a Q&A session. But what I really wanted to do is start off with a story. A uh, personal story of mine. I grew up here in Georgia and I went to a public school. And all the way through elementary school and PE, they had absolutely no idea what to do with it. Absolutely no idea. It was basically a social hour for me to go around the school and talk to my favorite teachers. So when I was in middle school, they had an epiphany that that probably wasn't right and that I should probably be included. Um, what's sad is what they came up with. <laughs> For the next three years, they taught me two things. I would throw a frisbee, which I'm still pretty good at, <laughs> and uh, how to jump, which I'm still terrible at. So my dreams of joining the circus are crushed, but nevertheless. Um, and after that, high school went back to being a study hour for me because I did not want to juggle the rest of my life. Um, and that was sad. And a lot of people asked me why I didn't do anything, and I didn't know there was any other option. And like I said, I coach a wheelchair basketball team, and we kind of did a survey of the other kids in the team, and we asked them what happened. And it was very, very similar. And so that's kind of why we started this session and wanted to talk to you guys, because what we've realized is that we have the person with a disability, the local level, which is basically you know your their families, the regional, and is like the schools, national, which is what Ann does in Washington with the ADA specifically, international with the Paralympic movement. And what we're really, really good about is talking about policy to the person with disability. And really, that's not enough. There's what I like to call the disconnect. We need to go this way. How do we get somebody with a disability talking about and advocating for themselves? Okay. So like I said, there's a disconnect. <laughs> anyway, so why does this disconnect happen? Uh, and this is me specifically, I had an in incomplete or inadequate knowledge of the ADA and relevant status, or statutes, sorry. And I was unable to advocate for myself, or I guess just himself for me. Um, and also, I could never really help anybody else in turn, and I felt mm -hmm. like a lot of people around me didn't know either, mm -hmm. so they could never really help me out in a positive way. And this, and this is a result also, I mean, for those of you who work in the rehabilitation field, you're familiar with this, but uh, people who sustain an injury um, at some point, you know, in, as a teenager or young adult, go through a formal rehabilitation program and may, actually may get some information on disability rights and, and, and some advocacy training depending on the rehab program that you go through. But young people who sustain their disability at a very young age or who are born with a disability typically don't get that um, formal rehabilitation and that information unless they're connected somehow with a network um, through peer support, through an independent living center, and in our case, through a sports program. So we have a, a perfect opportunity and an excellent setting to really share information and, um, and help educate the young folks and even the adults that we work with who may have a new disability or may never have received this information when they went through rehab so that they're more effective at advocating in situations where something's not working or an accommodation needs to be made. And um, so anyway, so that's really, I mean, we're... That's exactly the last <laughs> bullet point. Yep, exactly. The curriculum is missing from our community yeah. programs. So. Um, so what we wanted to do is kind of give you a basic overview of the ADA. I think that's a good first step. You have to know it before you can advocate for it. 
Um, and also, you can change to other people. So, it's a civil right and humanity rights law passed in 1990, went into effect 1992. Kelly, were you even around? You don't have to ask me. I know, I know, I'm but sorry. I, but. <laughs> I, was, I was three. So, not to put any age, I'm a little bit of a young guy. Um, and uh, we had new recreation regula regulations, which went into effect in March 2011, which had all kinds of things like service animals were declared that they had to be dogs. Um, yes. Some other ones with parks. Yeah, there's a lot of um, um, new specifications around recreational facilities, such as swimming pools, golf courses, playgrounds, um, a variety of others, um, boating docks, and. What else am I missing? There's a couple of others. Fitness centers. Fitness centers. Yeah, that's a big one. That's a big one. And then there are, yeah, and so there are other, um, other um, guidelines and, and, and code aspects of the ADA that were tweaked a little bit. But those are some of the major ones. And I will say this. Uh, when I was given this session, I took it upon myself to try to read the ADA. And it's like forever long and hard to understand. But if you do go to blazesports.org under our resources, we do have a specific section on that, and it's much easier to read, not to toot our own horn. Yeah, we've, what we've done is identified the resources that are, you know, summarized and condensed so that they're the most helpful for, for folks like us who just want to know and understand the basic principles. But in the meantime, we're going to go through right now. Um, and right now we're pretty much uh, primarily, the uh, Department of Justice is concerned with primary titles uh, two and three. and. It protects the people with disabilities in five titles. These five titles are okay. We're not going to do that right now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. This. These are all the uh, examples of uh, disabilities that are covered. So anything from HIV, which I didn't know until just recently, um, all the way up to sensory disabilities, physical disabilities, obviously. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a lot of people ask. You know, what, how do we define a disability? And kind of a general thing is if it affects one of these major uh, life activities, it's a lot more specific in the ADA, but generally, this is what they go by. So obviously caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, things like that. Okay, back. Go ahead. And, yes. From the, the other previous slide, the examples of disabilities, can you just talk for a second mm -hmm. and also people who are covered with perceived disabilities? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a slide, slide somewhere yes. in, in this deck that talks about the definition of disability. So the definition is um, a person is affected in one or more major life activities, which was the list that Kali just showed you, walking, eating, dressing, caring for oneself. Um, also, um, the definition is of a person who is perceived as having an impairment um, or have had an impairment. And um, hmm, I'm blanking on the one third one. Yeah, if you. If, yeah. Where they actually don't have a, a disability, but they're perceived by the public. Yes, so they yes, so exactly. Especially under higher you know, unemployment. That's right. That's right. Yeah. There's, there's, yeah. There's stigma around certain, you know, types of, of conditions and situations that may or may not affect a person's ability to care for themselves, to work. I mean, physically, but yeah, that it's a barrier. So, if you're perceived to have a, bar a disability or you have a dis an impairment that affects one or more major life activity, those are the primary. Okay. Yeah. So here are the five titles. Title one is employment. And don't worry, we're going to go through each one. Title two is public entities, uh, public transportation, local government. Title three, public accommodations. Uh, title four is telecommunications. Title five, anti-reality, retaliation, coercion, prevention. Um, that's not always easy to remember, so Dan kind of gave me a secret on what they do with Shepherd to kind of help get people It'll go. Um, he gives them this acronym, Get PT. These are the five areas it primarily covers government, employment, transportation, public places, and telecommunications. Obviously the sixth, or the, uh, the anti-coercion one didn't make it in there, but we'll talk about that one later. <laughs> okay, so Title I, employment. This is straight off ADA.org. Uh, no covered entity shall discriminate against a qualified individual on a basis of disability in regard to job application procedures, the hiring, advancement, or discharging of employees 
employee compensation, job training, and other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. So, what we did was we changed that because that's really long and this is a little easier to understand. Uh, employers may not discriminate in the application process, hiring, wages, benefits, and all other aspects of employment. Um, a good example of how this protects you, if you're applying for a job with a disability, the actual hiring process, they have to go and make that accessible to you in some form or fashion. Um, for example, if you couldn't get into the building, they would have to find a way for you to begin or change the hiring location. Um, to do the interview, or if, you, or if you're having a, a hearing impairment and the interviews are being done by telephone, then they have to be able to accommodate the person with the hearing impairment um, through an alternative you know, communication mechanism to do that. So. And you have to request that accommodation, obviously, if you've never um, met the people that you're going to be interviewing with, you have to disclose if you need that accommodation in order to get it. Another good one is they can't require anything of someone with a disability that they wouldn't require anyone else. Um, so if it's a scuba diving program and for whatever reason they don't require you to swim, just because you're in a wheelchair they can't require you to. Um, it has to be the same throughout. So that's Title I in, in general. Um, any questions on Title I before we get started? Title II? Okay. Well, I would say that I would say that employment is um, is a huge barrier for a lot of people with disabilities in this country and in countries throughout the world. It's it's a challenge. Okay, okay, thanks. So, um, so this is a, so this is an important one, but it's really even a challenge for a person with a disability to 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 get that interview. Absolutely. So, and then to get beyond the interview process, and there's a lot of education that needs to happen in the business community, in your local community, with business people, and all employers, really, even, even government, state and local government entities need to be educated. And, and we know that what we do, the programs that we do, the activities that we do, and our presence in the community really does help educate the public, and particularly you know, people who have the ability to employ people can really get an education when they understand that people with disabilities have significant abilities, drive, motivation, the, you know, the ability to show up and, and train and perform at a high level. So it's, um, that, that's the connection for us. Sport is a great um, connector to employment, both as an education piece for the, for the public who's doing the hiring and also as a skill development tool for those of us with disabilities. It builds confidence, it builds networks of contacts of people who could potentially help you get a job and you know all, all those great things that we need and want to see happen in this country. Yeah, yeah, yes. uh, my question is, what about if you have a job and you kind of move out due to the fact that uh, your, what you're trying to do requires standing, pushing, you know, lifting certain weights. And, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, what do you do with that? Uh, is there any, okay. uh, So I'm going to repeat the question because we're videotaping this session. So the question is, if, you're, if you have a job in a company or in an organization and you want to move up, and some of the requirements of the next level, the next position, um, may be physical in nature or things that you can't do or you're concerned that you can't do or there may, you may be perceived not to be able to do those things. What do you do and where do you go? And it depends on, it depends on your company or organization. If it's a big organization, you might have a diversity officer or a, a human resource, you know, re resource there or you may not want it you may not feel comfortable having that conversation with someone in your company you may first want to start by looking for a resource you know who is an expert on disability employment law so depending on where you live um, there are disability rights law centers in states um, throughout the country and so that's uh, one resource, one place to start is talking to an attorney who understands employment, this employment law very well and who can help maybe help you prepare to have that conversation with your supervisor or with the human resource person who's looking to staff that position. And, uh, and, and just think about other disability advocacy resources around you that might be able to help. But the Disability Law Center, I think, probably would be the quickest place to go to get more information on how you advocate for yourself in that situation because it may be just requesting a reasonable accommodation 
you know, when I, um, after I finished my master's degree in therapeutic recreation, I went to work at Shepherd's Center and I worked in the therapeutic recreation department. And one of the requirements, you know, of, of a recreation therapist in a clinical setting is to be able to help transfer, you know, people, because we were working with people with spinal cord injuries. And obviously, a, 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 an employer like Shepherd Center wants to have people with disabilities, you know, in the workplace, and they're committed to that. So it was easier to, you know, request that accommodation and also to learn how to assist somebody else in transferring. And anyway, so there are many ways to, to, to come at the situation. We've got a few slides afterwards that we get through this. We've got a few slides afterwards and uh, that'll kind of walk you through your step by step on you know, the different levels and how you get and advocate for yourself for that kind of thing. So, uh, title two. Okay, we're going to go more than title one. Um, I think we actually went through most of these. Oh yeah, it's important to know that employers with 15 or more employees um, are, must meet these qualifications. If you're, if you're an entity that's smaller than 15 employees, then um, it may be, you know, depending on what the accommodation or request is in terms of um, accommodating a person's disability, there's a, there are differences in terms of I think how. it's a good point to bring up that even though you yeah. might have less than 15, that doesn't mean that you can't speak up and say, I'd yeah. like to do these things, and yeah. I'd like to have these accommodations. Um, it might not be protected by the ADA, but I think most people will try to help you out. You can please ask. So, I think there's, oh, good, title two. Um, this is government buildings, access to information, website compatibility and public transportation. Um, all government buildings have to be accessible, especially when, say you're called in a jury, or you have a court date, um, if that court, say, is historic and you can't get into it, they would have to move it or make accommodations for you to be able to get in. So. And actually, I mean, if it's a if it's a government building, it should be accessible. If it's a historic build, if it's a thank you, if it's a historic building, um, that build that facility is not grandfathered, mm -hmm. um, and it is required to be accessible. Um, there are ways, for example, a historic building, um, the accessible entrance, um, there's a provision that enables them to put the entrance in the back door or a side door or an en a, a secondary entry to the building. And um, I mean, there are some specific things, and, and I'm going to just spend a minute talking about this because it comes up all the time and everybody in this country who works in an older building assumes that they're grandfathered and they don't have to provide access to people with disabilities. It ha it's, it's happens in every community and every one of us has um, you know, a dozen stories about that, but it's really important to know that. And when somebody uses that term you know, and explains that that's why they're not accessible, then it's okay to correct them. And you want to do it in a way that's that's providing information and educating them, not confronting them and you know making them wrong and beating them down because that they just don't they just don't know. But but that's. Uh, was there a certain year that the building, if it was built at this year or later, that it would be accessible? Or? Um, I mean, the law was was enacted in 1990. If if the it, there is a, there is a clause that says if if making a building accessible is an undue hardship financially on the entity that owns the building, then you know it may not be possible to to create access to that building. It's sort of you have to take those things on a case by case basis, but. Um, all communities, especially public, we're talking about government, you, you know, buildings were supposed to be, you know, cities and communities were supposed to put a, an ADA plan together for, um, a, and a timeline for when and how they were going to make those uh, um, changes and accommodations and also put in the money in the budget to ensure that that happens. So now we're 21 years past that, so there is, there's, there's you know, it's time if they haven't if they haven't done that. And so more along the lines of undue hardship, um, if they make any revisions since then, and it turns out to be, and it turns out to be major, they also have to make the same as regulations that they did on it before. So, yeah. So like, you know, for example, parking lots. They didn't have handicapped parking lots, and uh, they end up restriking and recovering everything. They need to be required to. So, yes, sir. 
You mentioned public transportation up there in that last bullet point. Mm -hmm. What about the MTA in New York, for instance, where there are several stations that don't have mm -hmm. access? Mm -hmm. What rights do we have for advocacy uh, to, for the authorities specifically about the MTA? I think, you know, um, you really have, I mean, you have the right to advocate, right, and, and educate and mobilize the advocates. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the, um, the city of Chicago is really a great community to model yourselves after because the CTA in Chicago had, you know, probably, I don't know, you know, equally in terms of the cost of renovating all of those stations, and they're not all accessible to this day, but the, you know, sort of the alternative accommodations with all the buses and the bus routes and, and the lifts and making sure that there were alternative, you know, public transportation um, access points for people with disabilities. It's not perfect. There's still a lot of work to do. Um, but, but it was the disability community coming together. I mean, every corner, rehabilitation centers, independent living centers, um, you know, parent um, organizations and associations, and also working with other civil rights um, advocacy groups in your communities. Um, is really important too. those who are focused on poverty alleviation and and those types of things because they're concerned about the same things and they're the people that you know that that they're working toward lifting out of poverty have similar challenges and people with disabilities fall into that you know into that um, category of, of vulnerable citizens too so um. I believe that the ADA yeah. yeah, so it allows for some leeway. Yeah, uh, what Bill's saying is the ADA allows for some leeway because the New York transit system is the oldest in the country or and then and then you have Boston and Chicago and and some of the stations to make them accessible is is really cost prohibitive you know and, and so if there's a if there's a sort of redesign or a new station you know the opportunity for a new station to go in nearby in the future and they plan that into the plans and the budget then that can help but also paratransit um, it is another form of transportation that can off, offset some of the inequities in transportation and accessible taxi services as well in the larger cities is becoming another way to try to um, address some of the transportation barriers. So I have um, three hands going up, um, Ben first, then Tim, and then, um, and then um, and Jason in the back, sorry. This is more of a question. Maybe somebody in the room will know the answer, but just because the building is old doesn't mean it's historic. Does it not have to be declared historic by the local government or some other authority? Yeah. Yes, yes, there are, um, na the National Historic Registry is one registry, but that still doesn't mean that the building doesn't have to be accessible. It has, you have to make, you know, the best effort to do that or at least make the first floor accessible. George Washington's um, home in Mount Vernon, Virginia is a great example of that. You know, it's a, you know, it's a national heritage site and you can access the, his home um, on the Potomac on the first floor and they use um, videos and, and pictorial images of the rooms upstairs for those of us in chairs because it just would destroy the historic nature of the home to put a lift in or lift on the stairs, you know, because, so that's, you know, so it's again on a case-by-case -case basis how we, how we do that. So I'm going to go to Tim next and then Jason. I was just going to chime in on some of the questions about transportation facilities and so forth that are like real old and to take a lot to um, alter them or make them accessible. One of the standards that the government, I think it might even be mentioned in the ADA, is technologically or architecturally infeasible. <laughs> so that infeasibility standard typically applies to public entities. So like the cost of tearing down an entire station in New York and rebuild it in an accessible way would be either architecturally or technologically infeasible. Yeah. Um, and, and that's where a lot of local governments um, are, are, they use that as kind of their defense in, mm -hmm. in some of those 
But it doesn't mean that they don't need to try to find alternatives, mm -hmm. such as what Ann was um, mentioning with paratransit or other surface. Yeah. And so forth. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate that, Jason. I had an experience recently with a restaurant. Uh, and they had a rooftop um, area. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a bar up there, mm -hmm. and that rooftop was not accessible. They mentioned, and it's a, uh, supposedly a, a historic building as mm -hmm. well. They mentioned that they had some kind of exemption mm -hmm. because of that is historic nature. What would that be, and how how long is that? Like? Do you know how many? Do you remember how many stories the building was? Because buildings that are two stories, is it two stories, three three stories and below, do not have to have an elevator or a lift in them. First of all, no, no. I think it was more than And and the other thing is, and I, I'm not an expert. Like uh, we'd have to ask an architect. I mean, sometimes there are um, you know structural code reasons why you can't build a lift all the way up to access the roof um, but but that's very common it, that's a I mean and that's a situation it's because those are the best places right <laughs> if you want to go and have dinner and dine out al fresco and yeah so that's it's frustrating so I, I mean it would probably it would probably be financially just you know too expensive. I know the um, apartment complex that I live in in DC, we have the same issue. And we've been trying to find, you know, ways to make it getting to the rooftop accessible because we can see we have a panoramic view of, of Washington DC and the Potomac River and you know, and we those of us who live there in wheelchairs can't take advantage of that, but but everybody's willing to try to find a solution if we can, but it's it is it's pretty cost prohibitive and challenging. About schools that are two stories, do they have to have? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I would, yes, yes. Yeah, what I was talking about is like, you know, so, there, so we're still on, on Title II, which is public services, so education would fall under that. If they receive federal funds, then they need to accommodate, you know, they need to would provide accommodations. Provide. Now, when I, when I was in high school, um, the the accommodation that needed to be made wouldn't have been done in time because I was you know so far along so but they still went ahead and put the put the um, elevator in the plans and in the budget and did that eventually so that the next students that came through um, would have that accessibility because a lot of times on the second floor there are maybe chemistry labs and you know Back then we had typing labs and things like that that couldn't be moved. You know, you, you had to go upstairs to do that. An outside ramp, is that considered okay if they make the military users go outside to access the side of the lower floor? Hmm, I don't know. I'd have to look at that specific. If they have really good, yeah. well, it sounds like, um, reasonable, how, how reasonable yeah. is that alternative route? Yeah. Is probably yeah. how that would be Suggestion. We can talk about that. But yes. Suggestion. Yes. I suggest we, we put down our questions and put them so that we don't miss. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love but it. I appreciate the interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll get to Title Three, and we can talk about that offline too. And with Tim too, we can figure out some solutions. So this is public accommodations, <laughs> Title Three. So public accommodations are the restaurants and the services and pro, you know programs and services in the community that are not government um, buildings and government entities. So all the things that we enjoy, like going to the movie theaters, the mall, um, the um, local sports complexes and arenas and those sorts of things. These accommodations have to be made within reason, of course. Um, like if we went to an amusement park, uh, my classic favorite was you have to be this tall to ride this ride. Um, and that's obviously your total height, but you couldn't just go in there and say, I'm in a wheelchair. That doesn't apply to me. There's obviously safety reasons why they do that. And so when it comes into safety, um, we can't sit there and try to flex our ADA muscles on it. It's, uh, we can have every ride to do that. Yeah, that's a really sticky situation. I'm sure you all saw the, the news story about the, um, the Iraq war veteran that we lost recently to an um, amusement park ride accident. 
So it makes you really think, especially if you're running programs and responsible for programs. If you're taking a group of, of people with disabilities to an amusement park, you want to be sure <laughs> that you're comfortable and confident and that person is comfortable and confident that they can ride safely on that ride. I know, you know, when I was younger, there were a few rides that I was on. It was too late, right, because I was on them, but I knew <laughs> I should not be on this ride. <laughs> and so the person next to me, who was usually somebody I knew, I would say, you know, hold my legs or hold on to me because I'm going to slide right out of the seat the next time this thing whips me around. So so, so it's something to, to really be conscious of. I mean, obviously, for many reasons, and those of you who, you know, work in parks departments and rehab hospitals, there's lots of liability um, things, you know, risk management, right? The risk management issues that, that you're taught to be aware of and as well as, as professionals, but... We can't um, echo that enough. So, yeah. so yes, people with disabilities do have the right to access amusement park rides. And now, 21 years after the ADA, amusement parks have gotten used to accommodating people with disabilities for the most part. Most part. But you also are you're responsible, number one, for making that determination. So, okay. Title four, telecommunication. Uh, this mainly has to do with the deaf and the blind. Section requires that all telecommunication companies in the U.S. take steps to ensure functionality equivalent services for consumers with disabilities. And also people who have may not have fine motor function in their hands and fingers in terms of operating cell phones and smartphones and, and um, you know, text-type equipment. The telecommunications industry has really gotten... Um, you know, much more engaged with the disability community, community in the last five to ten years so that they're learning this and figuring it out and especially the deaf community, I mean, the telecommunic they, I mean, they're, uh, they've been using the telecommunications um, devices that, that we now use and, you know, are, are new to us for decades. You know, those, those, those devices were designed and developed for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. But I have the, a friend who's deaf yeah. and, uh, I was trying to communicate how awesome text messaging was to her. <laughs> and she said, yes, I know. That's not really <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and Title V, um, basically what this goes into is if you ever feel the need to exercise your rights in ADA, you cannot be coerced or if in a job situation fired for trying to exercise your rights. Mm -hmm. This is basically to protect you. So those are the five titles. How many of you have heard of ADAPT? Mm -hmm. oh, a few of you. Three hands. Three hands went up. So ADAPT is a, a national organization that advocates for the rights of people with disabilities using um, civil disobedience. And so, and they're very effective at it in some ways. And sometimes, you know, that's a, a very effective way when all other forms of advocacy um, and communication have been exhausted. Um, um, ADAPT was, um, sort of came into existence because of the lack of access to public transportation. And for those of you who, um, you know, were around when, when I was around, <laughs> that's a polite way of saying that, right? Um, the, there was, uh, we saw on the national news people in power wheelchairs uh, cha chaining themselves to public transit buses in Denver, I believe, and, and New York. <laughs> okay, Bill. And, and um, all around the country there were ADAPT actions um, really taking radical steps to make the point that people with disabilities couldn't even, you know, get on the bus. You know, sort of taking the inspiration of, um, of a Rosa Parks to that level for people with disabilities. And, and, and so that was a really um, important um, part of the movement to establish uh, disability rights in the U.S. Was Buses, right? Oh, over the road? You're talking about over the road buses? Yeah, the over the road coaches, like Greyhound and Peter Pan. That's still an issue. That's still an issue. They have to be. Yeah, they're required by law to be accessible and to and to transport 
people with disabilities. Does this <clears throat> Title V yeah. also protect advocates who don't have disabilities? Who advocate ah, disabilities? that's a really good question. We're going to have to find out. Oh, thank you, Tim. Um, I'm not <laughs> totally sure that um, it's specific to Title V, but yeah. within several of the clauses, of, particularly uh, Title One, Two, and Three, mm -hmm. there is the anti-retaliation or affiliation um, uh, do, you know, disclaimers or mm -hmm. claims that someone can bring if for some reason you know, they're a vendor for people with disabilities and someone uh, you know, won't do business with them for that reason or something like that. So mm -hmm. those protections, uh, I'm pretty sure, you know, if they're not entitled to five, they're sprinkled throughout the other. And so they would cover parents and allies right. and coaches and right. everybody. Great. Thank okay. you for that. Good question, Bob. Okay, oh, yeah, this is mine. So, yeah, so we've been talking about it a little bit as people have been asking questions, but just dealing with, and, and when you're, um, you know, what we hope you'll do is use this information and, and, and this resource to, um, to train the folks that you work with. And so it's really important um, for someone who's, you know, sort of encountering um, barriers or discrimination in some form or another, just to counsel them on, um, you know, sort of, what's going to happen and how to handle a situation. I mean, a lot of it is, is very basic or conflict resolution, you know, type of, of training and concepts. But a lot of um, um, primarily implementation of ADA or enforcement of ADA and, and other disability rights statutes that I'll mention in a moment um, fall on um, fall on people with disabilities and their families and, you know, those those are allies um, because there's not enough money in a federal budget to pay um, the, the um, inspectors to go out and inspect every community in every city. Um, there is an active uh, division at the Department of Justice that's responsible for ADA um, implementation, monitoring, and um, you know, making sure and looking at when people's rights are violated. And so they have all kinds of mechanisms. It takes forever. There are all kinds of mechanisms in place, but it's not, anyway, so the majority of the, of the work does fall on all of us, and, and it is our responsibility. And it's our responsibility to do it respectfully and effectively and in a way that's going to that's actually going to get the result that you want whether it's a specific situation or you know an entire community that you want to take on and you know sort of get committed to um, to uh, building in accessibility where there isn't any so so the first thing you would want to do is make the person or business or entity aware of the fact that there is a barrier or there's something you know that they haven't done that they need to do and um, if you have experience with this, I mean, all of us are great problem solvers. You know, that's how we get through the day because, I mean, frankly, the, you know, our environments weren't built for us or with us in mind for the most part. I mean, more and more now in, in, in Cully's lifetime, it's been, uh, <laughs> it's been far, far better. But, um, but anyway, so, so. If you, can, if you can offer alternatives and solutions and things that would work, and you know, it may be a physical thing like a ramp, um, but, or it may be you know, there's a step to get into this shop, you know, could you, but, but anyway, there's no way to build a ramp, well, could you have, you, know, you could talk to the, the store owner or, or uh, business person about having you know, a, an alternative way to get into the building or to do business with that, you know, with that um, person. I'm telling me about pot belly. Yeah, are, are all of you familiar with the sandwich shop? It's a chain pot belly. So when they, um, when they designed their interiors, they um, all kinds of ways violated the ADA in terms of the way they built <laughs> the, the lines to go in and order your sandwich and go through the line and pay for it. And the Department of Justice got a hold of them because they, had, they were really just, there's just a plethora of pot bellies in Washington, D.C., and all of the in disability rights um, folks at Justice were going into this That's sandwich true. shop, which was a block, a block away from their office, saying, whoa, <laughs> this is a nightmare. So they, anyway, so they worked with National 
Um, and they, so now what they've done, they didn't redesign and tear out and you know, rebuild all of the interiors of their restaurants. What they do is they have a policy and um, most of the, most of the um, restaurants have a, a sign that says, there's a little wheelchair symbol and it says, if, you know, um, ask for assistance or, or please order at the, cash, at the cashier's register. So you just go straight there and, they're, and, the, and the staff is all trained. It's great. They see a person who can't go through the line and they come out and take your order. They put it through and then they come out and, you know, you just pay for it and go. And so that's a, that was a way for that you know particular um, company to not have to completely decimate, right? That you'd be decimated financially, but make some policy and, and service changes. And like I said, it really works. It's just you know, it, um, it, 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 yeah, so it yeah, so. yeah, that's right. Do, do, mm -hmm. do they get a fine, or do they have to correct it? Yeah, did they get fined? Is that what you said? No, they didn't get fined because they they worked to find a solution to do that. Yeah, the um, the cases that the big cases that the Department of Justice brings against, and it's usually major chains, mm -hmm. it's because they've gotten a number of complaints mm -hmm. from people from across the country, and it's sort of like uh, you know, it's sort of um, like a class action kind of type of situation, right, where um, I guess they're working on, is it sheets right now? Oh, I probably, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But there's a gas station, a national chain gas station. And, you know, so they're, uh, so they're understanding the violations. And in this particular situation, there probably will be damages uh, or, or the, 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 the company will be fined for the violations because it's been, you know, it blatant. In you know in in every community that they're in and you know and they have evidence because they're collecting evidence from people with disabilities who you know lived in and tried to use the um, the facility and ha have not so so there is a requirement in ADA for those of you who are chair users that um, gets talking about gas stations who now you know n they don't ever have people who pump gas right so you know it's a service center there's a cashier in there and you have to get out and pump your own gas Well, they're required um, to come out and pump your gas if you can you know if it's if if you're a chair user if it's kind of hard and challenging for you to get out of your chair and pump your gas or especially if you can do that and you still can't use the you know use the nozzle and stuff but it's been a real problem because gas stations you know over time since the 30 years that i've been in a chair you know, every gas station had some unintended who pumped gas. And then slowly but surely that, that has changed dramatically and it's really hard. And you can sit out there honking your horn, you know, until everybody else in the neighborhood is ready to, to choke you and they still don't come out. So, so is, yeah. that, is that the case period, period? Or some gas stations will say, or have signed up and says, if there's less than two people working, then this doesn't apply. Mm. Hmm. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So again, we're, we problem solve. We find solution. We find ways around it. I go to the same gas station every time I need gas, so they know me. Now that you know, when you're traveling on the road or you're traveling for business, I mean, there are all kinds of still challenges with that, but. <laughs> Who's in big trouble? <laughs> Kmart. Kmart. Really? For gas? Oh, do they have gas stations? No. Oh. What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, so the so those big box those big box stores um, that have a lot of stuff, a lot of merchandise stuffed into them, and and it's really hard to navigate the aisleways even if you're trying to walk through them. Yeah, yeah. I mean that and that's an issue, and and I know the Department of Justice has has gone after several of those larger companies because people have brought complaints before them and so they have to hear enough from enough people and that'll motive and that'll give them the justification to be able to address the situation and usually when it happens to one 
big box company, then the others, you know, make the adjustments because they know they're next if they don't. So. Yeah. Yes. One more point, Bob, or Bill, sorry. We need to tell our people to vote. We need to tell our people to vote. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Yep. How, next time we'll do a session on that. <laughs> how, do you, how do you use sports programs to mobilize the disability vote? No, oh, seriously. It's a, and get people to register to vote. I mean, all, all of these issues are interconnected and interrelated. Absolutely. Would you have more? Oh, I'll, 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 I'll be okay. How are we doing? Okay. We're doing great. Um, disability awareness training resources? Yeah, so these are, again, resources that we've used to, to go out into the community and actually train, um, you know, um, business owners on how, you know, and their staff on how to accommodate people with disabilities because there have been a lot of uh, businesses in the news, particularly in, in Atlanta for some reason, and, and specifically related to customers with disabilities who have service animals. And so, um, so we've taken the opportunity because we're, um, you know, because we're an organization in the community of Decatur to work with the local businesses because we frequent them and, you know, our participants frequent um, that, them in their shops and we just want them to be more aware of ways that they can um, be more accommodating and accessible, so. Okay. Um, this is kind of going on beyond the ADA. Um, yeah. There's certain places, like there's a place if you go near our office, there's a convenience store that's down there that is really, really hard to get into, but they're the most accommodating people in the world. They'll come up to you and ask what you want. And I think that speaks volumes to what you can do um, mm -hmm. beyond the ADA. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we wanted to go over, and maybe you could share this with your community and kind of get this going. Um, but these are simple things we can do without actually spending any money. Um, First thing is uh, first person terminology. A person first terminology. Does everybody terminology. know what that is? Does everybody know what person first terminology is? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so, well, so, um, so language, I mean, so words, um, words trigger pictures, pictures trigger thoughts, and thoughts trigger actions. And so when you apply that to the situation that we're talking about and people with disabilities, the words that, you, that we use to talk about ourselves, our colleagues, you know, people with other types of disabilities different than, different than ours is very, very important. And, it's a, and we have a responsibility to ensure that that language is appropriate, is, is used with dignity, and is used in a way that other people hear it and pick, up, pick it up and start using it. So person first language is where you always refer to the person first and then their characteristic. So person with a disability, that's where that comes from. A person who uses a wheelchair or... In the same vein as somebody, you know, you never say, or you're not supposed to, the blonde. You know, it's the same thing as the person is blonde. So you want to say the same thing. Mm -hmm. You said somebody with a disability, you know, it's a person with a visual impairment, that kind of thing. So. Yeah, so those are some examples, and we'll give some others as well, but I just wanted to sort of create the context. And this first, really, um, I mean, I, I learned about it when I was in, in my graduate program in therapeutic recreation, and I think it was someone in, this, in our field or in an allied field who really developed this um, and, and, and promoted it as a premise throughout the allied professions of, of um, people working in the disability field. And so now it's at least in, in the U.S. and, and in English-speaking countries, and, and not just English-speaking countries, because I know throughout the Paralympic movement there are similar, um, you know, the terminology and, and the person first terminology is being used. So, so here's some examples. Um, like I said, athlete who is blind, person who is deaf, um, person who has multiple sclerosis. Uh, this was a, a good one. What Anne was talking about with what you say creates an image. When you say CP victim, there's a certain image that applies that's not always the case. Actually, it's almost never. Um, so it's an athlete with cerebral palsy. Um, also like stricken by MD, horror books. Um, so I think we have some more coming up that are pretty good. 
Uh, the word retarded. Yes. So um, Special Olympics International has a campaign to eradicate that word from our vocabulary because it's just become such such a part of the moniker of um, of all of us. I mean, people of all ages use this when you know they're in a situation, and it's incredibly degrading. And what we were discovering was that young people with physical disabilities were using it yeah. because they want to fit in just like every other kid because that's a cool thing to say. So we did so we did some training with them on person first language, on self advocacy, on the reasons why, on their responsibilities. And you know, I mean I think we've had fairly positive results. And the other thing is we we went a step further and said you have a responsibility to call people out when they're using this word because it, it's it's offensive. And so it's um that's the kind of message that we wanna Okay, the hands are going up again. Good. Tim? Is there any movement put um, that you're aware of to eliminate the word handicap from legislation? <laughs> and, I think a lot of, and I think a lot of people uh, don't really know where that word came from. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Do you want to go ahead and share that? With yeah, does, does, there, does everybody in here know where the word handicap came from? No. Um, basically, it means cap in hand. So back 100 years or so ago, people with disabilities would always have a cap in their hand begging for money. And primarily people who are blind and visually impaired, I mean... Right, so that's where the word yeah. handicap came from, and it's still all over legislation and yep. resolutions in legislatures and Congress and, okay. and on a lot of, you know, employment disclaimer language and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so there is a move to... Well, it's not systematic. I would, so the question is, um, is, there, is there a move to eradicate the word handicap from... Our, um, you know, from our language, especially from statutes and policies and those sorts of things. It's not systematic. I mean, it is happening. Um, you know, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act used to be the Education of All Handicapped Children Act. So, you know, it is happening piece by piece by piece, but not systematically, I, I wouldn't say. So, um, how are we doing? Okay, we're good. So, so. Bill, you have a comment? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. So rap rap music uses this kind of in comic books comedy. oh in comedy in com yes comedians do use it's, yeah I've noticed it's, it's become yeah. more and more popular with the young younger people to use it mm -hmm. the last few years mm -hmm. more than it was five six years ago yeah yeah, it, yeah, it's really proliferated, and so that's something that all of us, even though we may not have, you know, a cognitive disability ourselves, or even maybe we don't work with people with cognitive disabilities, that doesn't matter. You know, it, it, we we are leaders in this field, in the disability field, and we're part of the community, and it's a very big community. So it's it's absolutely our responsibility to shut people down or to correct people. So.